I think if I um, said something rude about millennials, um, I would probably be in trouble in a lot of spaces. I might be able to get away with it here. But if, if, if this were a room full of millennials, I would very likely uh, and talk about this topic. I should really be uh, announcing my sexual identity, gender identity, romantic attachments, uh, my romantic orientation, and about three or four other things as well as part of that picture. And this is something that uh, seems to have changed drastically in the last uh, really five to seven years. Um, in the way in which people talk about sexuality and gender. And I'm really quite intrigued with, it, um, with how this works and how we um, do it. And um, there's a bit of a trajectory, that this, I don't interest myself with this anyway, uh, the, the trajectory that, that, that I come towards talking about that topic and the new languages of sexuality and gender goes back about five or six years to when I was working on um, queer youth suicide, where in this book project at the time, um, I was really trying to say that there is very little value in doing what we have been doing and doing what a lot of very mainstream suicidologists have been doing, which is looking at um, the causes of queer suicide and talking about them in terms of very, very outdated social conditions like isolation and lack of media representation and and so on uh, ideas of uh, the, you know, the, the, the all young queer people live uh, in rural towns uh, mostly in an American style sort of uh, setting and really are frustrated by the desire to move to San Francisco or Manhattan and never quite make it and so on all of the, the, these, these ideas that, that don't really work for the, uh, the present generation and what really the, the finding of this work was was that, that there are uh, particular gaps that are produced by the hetero binary in particular, and that this is, uh, I don't want to say causal of youth suicide, but it is a factor in the everyday lives of young people who are struggling with the ideas around identity and identification, and that those gaps are a uh, significant health and mental health problem that, that one actually does need to pay attention to. And that sort of started that, that particular process for me, uh, working uh, at, uh, sort of around the same time on um, uh, vulnerabilities and scandal. And I, I was actually talking about um, footy players, Australian rules footy players, which is a bit of an easy target when you're uh, thinking about scandal and, uh, and scandal issues. But really, one of the things that really sort of intrigued me around what scandals are and how scandals work is that they're not just for uh, public figures uh, like sports players and uh, uh, Hollywood producers in the last couple of weeks and, and, and so on, but that they are the mode in which we engage with each other as well. And uh, when we start looking uh, in particular at online settings, online forums, and Facebook pages and so on, we see a way in which people relate that operates exactly the way that scandal and scandal reporting works, that slippage must be investigated, slippage must be explained. So this is about the, uh, the, the fact that an intelligible, recognisable, coherent self and identity, an identity that matches behaviours, uh, must be produced, and that any kind of uh, glitch in that must be explained by confession. And that's really part of that Oprahization, for want of a better word, the Oprahization of, of, of the way in which we relate to each other, that one must confess and explain their anomalies and smooth these out. You know, I was always this, I was always that. And you know, so where we're, where, uh, I don't know, where I see it is, you know, so I suppose as a, a, a sometimes vegetarian at various stages, but you know, at the moment there's uh, some kind of slippage in that, which you know, occasionally happens. Um, in, a, in, in a meal choice, it's like having to explain them. People have sometimes been quite outraged at the idea that you know Rob's identity as a vegetarian is not quite coherent. So if we think about that, that's an application to me, but an application to a young person, and a young sort of 15, 16 year old, um, who is thinking about gender and sexuality and romantic attachments and so on, then, then we're seeing a much, much bigger field for that, that kind of play. And, and then the funny sort of the work I've been doing around digital identities and digital media is really, uh, I, I mean, quite quite simple, ultimately. Um, what, what I've been trying to do with this is, is to, to point to the fact that we've got to get over the idea of there being a real self and a digital self, a, um, a real kinds of uh, behavior and online behavior. This doesn't really work at all. And this isn't a new idea, I think. 
I think, to any of us, but that the way in which we engage with each other uh, is intertwined between those two forms of communication, you know, the, the, the real and the verbal and, and the digital, and that those older ideas no longer really work. But, the, but they do have bearing, because they have bearing in, um, in a lot of um, uh, theories that I, I think that, um, uh, apply. Um, now, this, this um, where, where I've gone with this, and uh, this, this is what I'm, I'm sort of doing a bit of work on at the moment, um, a book project around, uh, it was called Emergent Identities, and this is looking at these new labels uh, of gender and sexuality, labels such as non-binary, and I'll talk about some of those labels. Uh, but we were talking about hundreds of labels. We had, uh, it was 15 earlier this year, I think, or you know, late last year, we were talking about 15 or 16 or 17, and then these numbers keep expanding of, of identity categories and gender uh, categories and labels and so on. Uh, so I, I really want to unpack that and talk about and think about the relationship with digital media in particular. And in that particular project, I also want to talk about choice as well, and I won't today, but um, the way in which young people are talking about choosing sexualities and choosing genders and it's not as simple as saying now it's not a choice as opposed to uh, previously a, a biology or genetic essentialism but that there is a, a combination of both of these ideas at play and you know, people will talk in the same breath of an essence but at the same time of choosing an essence or choosing among several essences and so th th there's a complexification of the field of gender and sexuality that is for me, completely unexpected, and something that uh, three or four years ago I'd probably have laughed at in, in, in hearing this. I think that's been one of those uh, responses, but it's not necessarily the, the best way in which to um, think about it. Uh, the other thing that's been um, going on here is um, uh, the uh, Queer Generations Project. And this is a project uh, with, with, with Peter Abson and, and, and Mary Lewis, most of the ANU, and uh, Daniel Marshall, uh, and uh, Sujin. Others uh, um, have been uh, working on this. Um, we've been looking at uh, the uh, experience as a meaning of support and uh, the support belonging identity interface uh, across two generations people born in the 70s and people born in the 90s. Uh, two deliberately chosen generational groups. Um, people born in the 70s, uh, people who, for want of a better phrase, and I'm always a bit awkward about this phrase, but people who came of age, you know, or were, were coming into uh, sexual behaviours and you know, their sense of identity or into the workplace or into university study, but people who came of age in the 90s and then in the present decade as well, in the 90s and the, and the 2010s. And some very pivotal things were really happening, of course, in the 1990s uh, around sexuality and gender. Uh, through the Australian context, of course, decriminalisation of alcohol sexuality is pretty much being completed by, I think where Tasmania was, it's pretty late in the piece, but about 98, 99, 98. Uh, the, uh, the advent of queer theory, of course, in a, in a university and an academic setting, um, uh, the, uh, the, the profession, the, the, the beginning of professionalizations of interventions in HIV and so on. And then we've got the, the, uh, the, the later group, those born in the 1990s who come of age in the 2010s, where we're seeing, again, a, a somewhat different uh, social setting. And part of that setting, then, I, I, I think, is uh, in terms of support, a, uh, a professionalisation of support, the, uh, the removal of the figure of community from the way in which we do support and belonging, uh, the new ways of doing peer support that are governed by uh, policy frameworks that are, uh, should we say, more uh, more amenable to a setting like Headspace, uh, for example. Uh, so it's a very different environment, but, but, but both very, uh, very pivotal um, periods. That's what we've been looking for. Now, what we did in doing this is we didn't anticipate when uh, we first proposed this um, that there would really be any other way of thinking about sexual and gender subjectivity except through LGBTQ terminology. And in doing this, we, 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 I, th I think we felt there was quite a stable as a way of analysing and understanding the interface between support and belonging. But the more work that we did on this, the more we found that this is not really being reflected, particularly among the younger generations of those uh, born in the 1990s, but also, also in the, those born in the 70s as well. Uh, that it was not really uh, a workable framework for analysing the kinds of online discussions that we were looking at. And um, 
uh, not necessarily a useful way then of analyzing, for example, media texts and older media texts, that this new taxonomy, what I'm calling this new taxonomy of gender and sexuality, might actually um, uh, have new way, uh, or open up new ways of thinking about such texts and so on. But certainly that's not being reflected in the, um, the people we talk to. And I'll, I'll show a couple of examples of this. Now, forgive my uh, overpacked slides. This is for my benefit, not for yours, um, because I will forget everything that I wanted to say. Um, this is a bit of background, and this is not really, really very uh, important uh, today, but thinking about the uh, what, what's actually at stake as gender and sexuality, sexual uh, terminology shifts, what's at stake is the heterohomo binary and the masculine and feminine binary. And these, of course, we know are the, uh, the, the most significant nodal points that hold together the truth of gender and sexuality and have done for a very long time. They're not, um, you know, they're, and of course they, they, they circulate as a social resource. So uh, the the way in which uh, we use this theoretically, and the way in which um, in my work using Judith Butler, um, you know, we understand this is that they, they operate as a discursive framework uh, in which one is invited to perform one's identity in a coherent and intelligible and recognizable way. And then of course that doesn't uh, cover everybody, but what uh, occurs then is that one must be answerable in terms of those binaries, so if one's sexuality is something somewhat different, uh, it is the, the, the call to confess that difference and make clear how that difference will work without undoing that particular binary. And of course, we've, we've critiqued this for a very, very long time. In the 1960s, uh, Marxist psychoanalysis uh, analysis, uh, did so in the 1970s, gay liberation moving through uh, that Marcusean analysis, um, and, and particularly Dennis Altman's work, did precisely that with the idea of the end of the binary and, 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 and in, in Dennis's phrase, the end of the homosexual. Uh, the 1990s, from a slightly different framework, we did exactly that as well um, with, with queer theory and the, the, the application of post structuralism to that binary, really to say that, uh, really to, to, uh, to expose the, um, the uh, impossibility of a truth to that binary and, 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 and the truth of languages of identity. But they did remain dominant and public and political. And this is one of the things that's, uh, that's quite often interesting to me about uh, 1990s queer theory, that it didn't actually do more, that there were certain ways in which uh, it's operated in public work and in, um, in uh, community activism, uh, particularly around theatrics that did some of this questioning. But it didn't do more to unpack those binaries or to unpack an, an essentialist identity. Um, well, and the real reason for that, I think, is that that deeply felt attachment to categories. That this is not as easy as saying, well, here is an alternative way in which one can understand this, but that uh, that, that, that attachment is, 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 is palatable and meaningful for people. And this, this is, is a thing that I'll come back to. But also the, the, the uh, strategic essentialism that's at play. We couldn't really have been doing uh, marriage equality and we couldn't have had a yes response in the marriage equality postal survey non uh, thing. Uh, so I won't disparage it now, right now. 24 hours maybe, but not today. The, um, th th that we, um, we, I don't think that could have worked without an idea of strategic essentialism. Uh, you know, but what we've actually um, produced is, is, is a notion of same-sex uh, uh, marriage and opposite-sex marriage, and that, that's maintaining a particular binary. It is not going to be framed, and legislation is very unlikely to be framed as anyone from anywhere. And of course, there, there are enormous exclusions that work with this. I know I'm thinking of the people who, uh, who have transitioned, who have been forced to uh, divorce in some states in order order to transition. Uh, we think of people for whom our masculine and feminine identities aren't actually necessarily meaningful, but who will be invited to marry as if those are the only available categories. So uh, you know, that, that's part of that strategic essentialism, that play, and that, that is going to be quite problematic. And I, I think it's going to result in a number of health uh, and, and, and mental health issues, uh, you know, rather than the idea that this is suddenly going to be a cure-all in, in, in that particular um, framework. Um, sorry, more packed slides. So, so beyond those dichotomies, uh, so where, where those dichotomies have been put in question? I mean, part of that in the 90s was queer theory, and today, at the, uh, uh, down the bottom, is, is, is emerging in the social justice communities in Tumblr with that new taxonomy of genders and sexualities. Um, but what was also happening, really, is the, uh, the digital um, uh, communication setting as well. 
In the 1990s, at the same time as queer theory is being done, at the same time as ideas are circulating in the academy at least, and to some smaller extent outside, we have a Web 1.0 digital communication framework. So that's pre-Facebook, YouTube, pre-Wikipedia. It's uh, To some extent, it's pre-Google. It's using uh, what were the search engines then? I think Ask Jeeves and you know and, then, and so on. And, you know we're doing email on. Um, someone reminded me yesterday on Eudora and uh, sort of these these very very old ways of, of, of doing things. So they were not about cloud uh, uh, cloud and we're not about user generated content. And they were not about visual uh, representation either. Virtually everything uh, was being done in a textual way. Visual circulated, but uh, on a dial-up modem, when you know, every time you downloaded that photo and it came line by line, it was a four-minute you know, um, uh, waiting period before you saw that porn or whatever else where people weren't downloading. Uh, so you had this, but it, 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 uh, it produced uh, terminologies of fluidity and terminologies of play. It produced the idea of a separation from the real and the embodied and an, 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 uh, an idea of, uh, of, of communication that, that was theatrical online. And this worked, I think, quite well with the idea of queer theory, this, this, this co-creative environment in which one could think in terms of fluidity, as problematic as that term really is and, and, and as undefined as, as it remained there. Now, 2013, 2014, where we start seeing this new terminology emerge is, uh, is in settings such as Tumblr, where people also do a certain amount of play, and there is a certain uh, kind of theatrics, but it's underlying it is also a certain kind of authenticity and a demand for authenticity and a demand for authentic identities as well. So you can play, but you must also express as if there is an authentic underlying identity um, doing that. Uh, you know, do, doing that play, performing that play. But what we actually see, I think, in these settings is initially younger persons who are seeking new ways of doing inclusivity, trying to find ways that are going to be inclusive of those who would otherwise have been left out. So those are the people who I'm thinking of in terms of the, the, the suicide work, those whose identities are not necessarily representable. Let's do that without finding new ways and new languages to include without disavowing authenticity. And I want to come back to that because I think that this is really one of the keys that's at play. Authenticity does not dissipate as, as, we, uh, as, as the terminology and language emerges. So it really is in that, that Web 2.0 and 3.0 uh, environment with which we're hearing younger people's voices in which uh, the ways of communicating uh, differ quite substantially. This is not about finding the expert advice and moving from the book and the, and the, and the page into the, onto the screen, but uh, in which language and ideas and concepts actually emerge in, the, in those particular screen-based settings. And that, that really is one of the key um, differences, I think, in how uh, the heterohomo binary is uh, is being uh, or has been critiqued. Um, that's probably not very readable from here. This is uh, this is where we're seeing some of the um, the uh, orientations and gender identities um, emerging on OkCupid, the uh, United States dating site. Uh, we see some of the genders emerge uh, slightly prior on Facebook, where there was a trial of I think it was about ten, eleven, and seventeen different genders that, that that were tried, and then it was decided that that wasn't really producing a list wasn't really workable, uh, and so I think currently it's now the, you know, uh, state your gender um, and, and, and your sexual orientation as you like in your own language. Um, that's, uh, th those were those, but you can see, if you, if you see right down at the bottom of those, there's, there, there's not very many. That, that's where we're seeing, uh, what, 13 orientations and 22 genders, so it's, it's not huge. Um, the Age of Shitlord site, beautifully named, uh, website has uh, hundreds of sexuality and gender identity descriptors and definitions, and there are many other websites that are devoted to helping categorize and unpack and give examples and so on to this this, this new language. Um, I don't know if I can, um, if I've got this here, but I might just, I do. Uh, I might just have to open this. Because there are so many, I can't actually um, uh, remember all of the definitions anymore. And uh, I, I think people would need to be, um, uh, tested on it. Um, I'm 
sure people are doing this kind of thing. They're probably quizzes. Well, we, we know there are quizzes, and there are quizzes that help people as well, uh, Facebook quizzes, to help one work out what your gender identity is in terms of these, these hundreds. And uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so th this is our um, this is our sexual list, um, and this is uh, one of the ways in which this is complexified into a into a matrix. Um, that there are sexual, romantic, sensual, platonic, and aesthetic factors that one actually has to give as part of one's identity. It's not enough just to say that one is gay or one's queer or you know one one wants to be fluid or, or anything else now, that, that you've actually got to give your romantic idea to, uh, orientation as well. So one can be um, you know, sort of uh, heterosexual sexually, but uh, homoromantic, uh, which would be a, an attachment to persons of the same gender, which would be a very, very simple identity framework. Uh, you have to add the essential, who you want to hug and kiss, which could be a completely different uh, gender or uh, orientation or identity. Uh, who you want to be friends with, which is sort of just kind of typically outside of sexual, but clearly the, the, the overlap and the crossover is, is, is being talked about. So this is, we're talking about a fairly well worked out, sort of uh, just well discussed uh, setting. And then the aesthetic, who one, one finds aesthetically pleasing as well, uh, needs to be accounted for. And in a way, I, one thing, and I'll come back to this, but one of the things I, th I think that actually happens with that is, you know, so as a, a straight man can find another man aesthetically pleasing, and if you have a different uh, category, a different axis of attraction at play, that uh, doesn't, that, that, that would prevent slippage into homoeroticism. So, you know, you know two, two boys can, can look at each other's abs and find that it's wonderfully uh, aesthetically pleasing, but it won't necessarily affect their, their romantic or sexual attachment. It will probably only be sensual if they actually touch each other's abs. Um, and you can probably do that as a platonic friend anyway, so that, that would actually be okay. So this, this, is, this is how that list actually works, just, just to be um, uh, rather random uh, with it. Um, I'll, I'll mention asexuality because this is something that, that comes up a lot, that this actually operates as an identity category now, as opposed to an absence of sexuality or eroticism or attraction and, and so on. And I think that there's something very, very interesting that there's a lot of work that is going to be needed on this. Uh, certainly in uh, the Queer Generations Project, in um, among our participants in Western Australia, um, in one focus group of about, oh, probably about nine or ten people, I think we had at least two people who identified as asexual um, in the 1990s generation, three or four overall. Um, it, was a, it was a fairly high percentage. 25 people. Uh, so it's, uh, so the, as, a, as a, uh, a sexual identity, it's, it's, it's coming to its own now rather than being seen as, as a, a health problem or a mental health problem or as a, as a, a being outside and, and so on. Um, some of the, the obvious ones are here bisexual. Uh, uh, Borea is a, is a sexual identity which is having an exception to your usual orientation. Um, Burst, I am burst, maybe. Well, I'm, I'm not, but a person might say that they are burst, uh, which means that their that one sexual identity is having spikes in attraction that fade away after a while. So this is a, as a pattern actually comes to take on an identity category of its own. Um, cease is usually being um, alloerotic, yet occasionally feeling a sudden loss of attraction and then returning to normal. So we were talking about very, very nuanced, you know, down, down to the, the, the microscopic level. Of, um, of identity. Um, Frey, I think I like Frey. Frey, only experiencing attraction towards those you are less familiar with. The feeling is lost when uh, they become closer or more familiar, so it's the opposite of demisexual, in which, which you are only attracted to people that you're actually close to or familiar with or have known for some time. Uh, so, Again, you know, something's again more more obvious. Uh, Grey, A, do not normally experience sexual attraction but can sometimes. Um, and there are alternate definitions of this, so they're, they're not very, very complete. Um, well, that seems a bit old-fashioned, heterosexual, <laughs> homosexual, uh, calosexual. The, the one, one of the ones I like most, I think, is uh, sapiosexual, which is uh, attraction to people uh, of the uh, who, who are intelligent, sapiosexual. And uh, which, which I would have thought applied to most, but maybe not, not necessarily. Uh, 
Uh, others among the fog gender, fog, uh, among the gender identities, non-binary is the obvious big, uh, most significant one. Uh, some of the others are a bit more, uh, uh, you know, sort of apparent and recognizable, such as trans man and trans masculine. Fog gender is among, again, my, my, my favorite ones. That, that's a gen, I better look that up so I get it right. The gender list. See, so these are all the genders one can be, or two, still only on A of the 22 pages available. Um, fog gender, a gender which is close to a certain gender but cannot be directly pinpointed due to brain fog. So you might be, I might be mad, but I might be feeling a bit brain fogged at the moment, so maybe I'm not a man, and you know, I might be just sort of in that space but not quite there. Now, you know, what I think is really, really interesting, though, is that, is that we do laugh at this, and you know, and we do, you know, I, th I think us in this room find this, this, this you know, slightly absurd, but um, it's meaningful and it's very meaningful, and there are again deeply felt attachments to these identities, which people will fight for, um, and this is what we found in the Queer Generations Project uh, among the younger cohort that there are people using these identities. This is what we're finding in online work. This is what we're finding in talking to people. This is when uh, when I talk to um, uh, health service providers in Western Australia, one of the things they really want to know about is how are people were using these identities because they they get there so we, we uh, you know they, they get told this you know uh, someone comes in to see the GP and says look I'm you know I'm I'm aromantic but I'm also gray a and you know I have fog I have, I'm fog gender and they are baffled about well how do we actually work with these ideas and, uh, and understand this, this particular language. So it's, it, it, there is a lot of significance around that. Uh, the other thing I think about the Queer Generation Project as well is that it's not limited to the younger generation. The 1970s group was certainly picking up on that particular language as well. And so, so we're seeing it uh, sort of move to an, to an older uh, age group. I think initially among those who were studying uh, went a little bit older as well um, and, and, and being in university settings. But um, yeah, I, I think the language has become used, uh, you know, quite quite uh, broadly. Um, the, these I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on these, but um, these these were some of the uh, the examples we were seeing in the um, uh, some of our interviews and focus groups. Um, uh, the this one identifies bisexual. Previously, I was identifying as lesbian, but then my partner was like, "I'm non-binary," and I was like, "Okay, so I need to adjust or re-identify here." And I, I think this is quite interesting. So, you know, so this person says, "Well, I'm, I'm lesbian, but oh now, but I, and so I'm attracted to women, but also I'm attracted to my partner, who is now identifying as non-binary, which means I'm also attracted to non-binary people." Um, and of course, the non-binary transition may not actually be a visual transition, but, but a, a more emotive or an affective one. So, so the um, having to work on renegotiating one's sexual identity then as bisexual is uh, really what's at play there. Uh, the asexual one is in the um, uh, the middle. I'm 22, I identify as asexual. There's a learning process for me. Going through high school, just figuring out that something was just fucked up, but figured out a couple of years ago what it was, i.e. that why it was really this. So it wasn't that I wasn't attracted uh, appropriately to, to people and I didn't want to have sex. I was what, it, 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 it's that this is what was really going on in my life and this is my identity now. Uh, the last one, uh, again, I, I'll probably start laughing and I'll try not to. I identify as gender fluid, I'm demisexual, biromantic, panromantic, but I've always gone by bi, so I just say biromantic, which means attracted emotionally to uh, two genders. Um, um, I would like to study youth work probably next year. And I've left that the quote in because I think that's really important that we're talking about people who are on the precipice of being in service provision roles as well. Uh, so that, that language will act, is not actually just coming from, uh, from the, our clients and uh, to service providers, but will actually. Be, be used in that particular way. And that, 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 that very idea of having a string of signifiers through which to identify one's uh, sexuality, gender, and aesthetic attachments, and so on. Now, <clears throat> what happens then with these? They're not just. So I'm thinking about the just, because when I talk about these with a lot of people, people will say, oh, it's just theatrics. It's you know, just, just what people are putting on. So, so people are just really gay or really lesbian and or really straight, and they're just putting this on on top. The thing is, no, because they are deeply felt attachments, and they're performative, they're negotiated, they're reiterative, they're policed, people police their own, they police each other's, and so on. So it's, it's not just that. 
and they're not just online either. They're, 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 these are really being very much used in you know sort of the, the everyday life. So it's a common misperception that oh, this is just how people would do it on Tumblr, or this is how people identify themselves on Facebook and so on. Um, I've had to turn to Raymond Williams uh, for the first time in years and years and years to uh, try and make sense of this, and. Um, uh, I'm still not entirely sure that this actually works, but I think Williams' structures of feeling is somewhat useful here as a way of thinking this through. The residual of the dominant of the emergent, so you know, the residual of that which is formed uh, in the past, the dominant which is you know, sort of uh, today uh, late contemporary capitalist uh, neoliberal culture, and the emergent, the new practices that might be reincorporated uh, and, 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 and dominated, but might not. They might challenge the dominant and certainly will try. The way I've been trying to think about this is um, the residual is uh, Erica Betts and Lyle Shelton and you know a bunch of other nasty homophobic creeps in uh, Parliament and elsewhere. Um, it's residual because it's part of the social process, but it's not part of the dominant in any way whatsoever. And I think you know, even regardless of whether we want to think of say the of the postal survey as a way of, of showing what might be dominant and what might not be or if we just want to think about what, what is deemed an acceptable, tolerant framework um, you know, at play, which I think is that het versus LGBT binary, the essentialist uh, idea of identity. So what Penny Wong stands for, I think, is, is pretty much in the dominant now, and I, don't, I think it's very, very hard to say that that's not the case. Um, and so a rights model, a sexual citizenship rights model approach. Uh, the emergent then, so the, these new terminologies, um, so they're competing with the dominant. And they might replace it, or they might be reincorporated, but we use marginalization and ridicule as the way traditionally of seeing the evidence as being you know, not part of the dominant, distancing it. And this, this might be, I don't think it's going to be the only or the best way of trying to make sense of this, but it might be a, um, a somewhat useful way. Where we see the criticisms of this new, um, this new taxonomy um, we, we, get, we get the bestiality argument, and I really don't understand why Cory Bernardi and several other uh, Liberal Party politicians have to constantly refer to bestiality. They seem to be absolutely fixated on this, and you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure there might be a reason. But the, it's, this, this, does, this does seem to come into play a lot, the idea that, you know, oh, well, once we start accepting that people might be attracted to uh, only having sex in a concrete building, which I think is one on that, that list, then we're saying, well, you know, but we won't it just be animals and eggs. Uh, you have comments, like, I, I, I came across this one last night. If I had a dollar for every gender, I'd have two dollars and a pile of counterfeits. And so that's that kind of ridicule, uh, you know, the the the, um, the, the, the ridicule-based uh, criticism. That you know, it's like there are two real genders, uh, male and female, and anything else is just just being silly, really. And you know, that, that that's that kind of uh, position. The alphabet soup claim is the other that we hear all the time, and I, I think that that one is one that certainly I'm finding I'm a little bit more offended by than than I might have been five or six years ago. That you know, it's like let's not keep using that claim. Seems to be. I have a lot of elderly uncles who seem to refer to the alphabet soup constantly. Um, the political position, though, is um, you know one that's uh, again around the strategic essentialist arguments that that you know it's like oh that's all very well, but it's complexifying the message. So keep it aside, keep it quiet. Don't make things more complex. We just want to have simple. Here are the queers and here are the straights, and this is what we are actually asking for. Um, and there's a very simple. Sort of gay lesbian uh, perspective. The anti safe schools coalition um, perspective, though, that was also um, in circulation across the last year, um, did talk a lot about that. So, uh, people like uh, former Labour leader Mark Latham, uh, full, was uh, constantly uh, referring to um, those instances where there was something in Safe Schools Coalition discourse that was a little bit more complex, that belonged to this new taxonomy, such as non-binary identity. And you know, he would talk about this as cultural Marxism, as so many would, uh, mistakenly collapsing Marxism and queer theory, which are not you know, necessarily the best bedfellows in any way 
at all. Um, so it really, really simplified this, but we're trying to effectively creating a scare campaign around it. So uh, you do have that criticism of that particular language as well. Uh, two more. Lenore Bell's was um, a little bit more substantial uh, because she based these on uh, justice claims. Lenore Bell was writing in, um, in, in 2013 as this was starting to come about and did some quite good criticism of this, but I'm not necessarily in agreement with it at all. Um, she was concerned that these labels were not really authentic, but that they are fantasies unexpressible in real life. So she spoke of attention-seeking millennials, that this is about you know, straight boys who are trying to be something other than a straight boy and you know, pretending. Uh, so in the 90s, you know, I'd paint my nails black to upset mother, and this would be the new way of upsetting mother, really. Um, she was concerned, though, this, this I think is a bit more legitimate, that these are labels that are primarily expressed by comfortable middle-class white Western people uh, with freedom to experiment beyond the very, very tight political coalitions that are sometimes needed in, in other settings. And uh, obviously there are, there, there, are contents, uh, there are continents other than, than Australia that, um, you know, where, where, these, uh, where older models are absolutely vital because they're the only way to fight and the only way to engage in a, um, in a struggle. The, uh, the non-binary toilet example, I think, is a significant one here. Um, the, I don't want to label this one, but um, uh, the questions around um, non-gendered toilets are very legitimate. The, um, I was at a conference in Adelaide uh, last week and there was a call for uh, not just uh, non-gender toilets but for a non-binary toilet only. And um, that this is, you know, so this would be only for non-binary people uh, altogether. I thought, well, this is very, very interesting, but um, the, 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 uh, the, that kind of demand uh, does assume resources, and it does become very much a first world problem uh, in a world where the majority of people still don't have any kind of water to flush away their own effluent at all. So the demand for more toilets as opposed to, as opposed to fewer is, 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 is problematic. But uh, I realise that, that the, the, it's, it's going to be, that one's going to be a very, very heated political issue. Um, the, the last one for me, though, in terms of the criticisms, is, is, is one that I've been thinking a lot about, though, which is the, the surveillance and border policing that I'm seeing a lot on uh, pages like Facebook, where people will go through each other's Facebook pages um, to criticise or to police or to surveil and check is a person actually the uh, identity label that they are talking about. And so there are some quite uh, hurtful things uh, being said and quite uh, things that, that, that are vulnerabilizing people and, and, and excluding and marginalizing in ways that I think are somewhat terrifying. So going through, it's like, you know, uh, I've gone through your Facebook page and, you know, you might say that you are asexual and, uh, and bi-romantic but, and sapiosexual and this aesthetic, but I don't see that. And when I look at your photos from, you know, 2013 here, you are clearly not that. And so this, this, um, the ways in which we've made available the, the opportunity to police these pasts, I think, is, is, is um, uh, going to be problematic with how this actually works. This is a this essentialist. This essentialist idea, and this is where the authenticity seems to come back again and again, that this, in these particular instances, this is not about choice. And that's where the struggle might actually be. My right to choose the identity label I have now versus the claim that, okay, you might be a, uh, a you know, sapiosexual demigirl, but you are, uh, and you might be that, but you are, always have been that. And even if you didn't necessarily know it, we need to see the evidence that you always have been that. It's, it's that moment of slippage, again, that, that, that becomes policed. I, I think this, this is um, you know, really worrying. Again, for me, from a health perspective, because what does this actually do when one has to uh, undertake this intensive labour, to main, not just to maintain, but to prove across the past? Uh, we curate our identities online. And, you know, we, and, we, and we accept that. And, uh, I use um, Brady Robard's work a lot uh, and Sean Lincoln's work a lot around that, uh, how we do that in, in social networking sites, uh, to cu that we curate the sense itself, that it's not just simply blah there, and even at a, at a somewhat unconscious level. But there's, I think, another level of labor that goes on there with having to re-curate all the time uh, just to make sure that everything is actually coherent. So coherence hasn't gone. 
And this for me is the key, that these are not as radical and interesting and engaging as perhaps some of the 1990s work that we actually did around theatre and performativity and, uh, and uh, other ways in which we uh, do diversity. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes? I can do five minutes. I won't read out any more versions, but, but let me just skip that. Uh, look, no, just, just very, very quickly, just, just to say that, um, I mean, we're, in, in, of the four um, uh, aspects of the conditions that make these new labels possible, and then I don't want to just, just to end on a, on a question of, well, what is indigence anyway? But, uh, I mean, the first of these is sexual citizenship. And what, uh, you know, we really, my, my take on this is that the condition, the, the line down the bottom, the conditions for making a sexual gender identity utterable within regimes of sexual citizenship are historical and change over time. The sexual citizenship worked very, very well for an idea of gay, lesbian, LGBTI um, for some years. But really what we're actually seeing now is the way in which this becomes the, um, the output, the outcome of sexual citizenship. So it's uh, where actors are, are encouraged to define themselves, as uh, Jeffrey Weeks had it, in, personal collective by, in terms of personal collective identities, by sexual attributes, to claim recognition and to claim rights. Um, and that really what happens then with this as a framework is that in a digital networking setting, um, people are encouraged to find ways to deal with the marginal within the marginal and to do that by producing these new labels as a way of saying, well, this is how one can fit. One can claim rights and recognition, not by saying in a, in a uh, more long-winded way, oh, I'm gay, but you know, my taste of this, and this is my experience, and this is my history, but to boil it down to a simple signifier that can work in order to be recognized and in order to claim those kinds of rights. And then, of course, you've got a kind of a market economization of this, because these labels are, are not just, just articulated, but they're consumed. So they become this, this productive form for articulating, uh, for, uh, articulating subjectivity, that, that one does this in terms of making choices that are not necessarily choices, authenticity and choice together. Uh, second, really quickly, cults, cu those cults of authenticity, that demand for intelligible identity that that surveillance produces is really at stake and, and it is key. It produces new kinds of regimentation. So if heterohomo no longer works, then we actually need new identity categories and this broader range of labels in order to be able to state one's identity in an authentic way. Um, and so this is really again about you know shrugging off that 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 queer theory idea of of, of, of fluidity and saying well you know no this is you know that this this doesn't work and that, that seemed to work so well in the 90s like, like I say as much as we didn't define it and didn't uh, do enough to deal with the problems of the concept of fluidity but the ability to move through different tastes perspective orientations over time seems to become limited then uh, and, 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 and disavow. Uh, but we also have the disavowal of the institutional, a populist disavowal of the institutional, the, the received norms of the medical expertise. And of course, six or seven years ago, this seemed like a really, really good idea to disavow the institutional in, 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 in many ways. And we did that and, 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 and we wanted to do that. But now, and I don't want to give this a positive or a negative, but I do want to say that, that this is, becomes part of the way in which the, uh, this a language, a new language can emerge. And we have to do a lot more work around this, I think. But it's, it's about saying, to some extent, that well, that expert view, the expert view of one's elders, the expert view of one's own community, uh, of those who speak in it, is not workable for me and I have my own perspective. So it's not the same as Donald Trump's populism, but it's, you know, it's, it's not entirely separable from it um, either. And then finally, the, 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 the contradiversity that's at play here. So this is where the, the fluidity claim, um, which might have undone heteronormativity if we articulated, and we didn't quite do this in the 90s, but, but to some extent this, this was uh, sayable then, if we articulated all sexuality and all gender as fluid, then masculine heterosexuality becomes questionable. Now, this is not doing that in any way at all. And uh, to some respect, uh, in some respects, uh, these labels are anti-diversity. So you get a label like heteroflexibility. And this is my, my sort of favorite one. And this is really to say that one is heterosexual and yet 
can do a bit on the side. So I could be a straight boy, but I can do a bit with other boys uh, on the side and I, and I will be heteroflexible. And then that will be an identity and an acceptable identity. But what that does then, of course, is preserve heterosexuality and say, it's like, well, heterosexuals couldn't do that. And this is absolutely impossible for a heterosexual man to do that in any way. So rather than that, fluidity, you've got this, this, this at stake, and it's, it's doing a, it's a kind of a protection work that is, you know, in my perspective, uh, contra diversity. So in all of that, so across those four, um, the, the, those four issues, um, I think I think we should end on this point. Uh, how do we then explain emergence? Um, because it's not enough to say that you know these things emerged, but it's there. There have to be factors of, around what makes these. What, what, what makes emergence actually occur? And again, I, I mean, I, I was talking about Raymond Williams before, and I, I don't know how I've got to Gramsci at all, uh, but in trying to find an explanatory framework, I think it's been really quite important to look to um, older cultural theorists in order to be able to uh, find a language that says this is sensible, because queer theory didn't quite make this work at all, and, and queer theory didn't predict this in, in any way. And post-structuralism doesn't provide the kind of framework that I would have liked to find to be able to say this. So here, um, I was just thinking about Gramsci, and so I'm trying this on really, and I, I don't really know quite know where I stand here, but Gramsci, Gramsci talked of crisis, and he's talking really about political crisis and ongoing political crises that create an uncurable structural contradiction and if we think about, say, um, the economic crises in the US over the last few years and over labor and change of labor and so on, create uncurable structural contradictions, particularly for politicians who can't answer these at all. Um, and in that, in that US setting, uh, results in Donald Trump. Here, though, I think it results in uh, what uh, Stuart Hall in Reading Graham, she's talked of as, 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 as formation, a new balance of forces, the emergence of new elements, the attempt to put together a new historical block, new political configurations and philosophies, a profound restructuring of ideological discourses. Now really, what I'm thinking about here is that you know, we've got a status quo, and that's that essentialist, discrete, binary identities. That's the marriage equality debate. That, that's that's you know, uh, our traditional perspectives on sexuality and gender. The crisis, though, is the knowledge of slippage. It's that crisis that emerges, really, in the 60s, and it's uh, with, with psychoanalysis. But it's the crisis that, um, and, and, and then with queer theory in the 90s, it's the crisis that this is what people have done anyway. It's the crisis of knowing that well, I might identify this way, but momentarily I have an attraction that's working in this way. How does one actually explain this? and How does one actually work with this idea? Um, so these slippages, the response then becomes the new framework that responds to slippage and uncertainty by uh, conserving the original identity categories motif, the idea of authenticity, rather than adopting the, the far more challenging and radical fluidity. So in a way, it's a, uh, the, this new language might be something that actually works as, um, you know, as, as the bringing together of contradictory forces, you know, the idea of the, the, the homophobic perspective, the idea that, that they're produced homosexuality in the first place, the idea that produced you know, sort of the, uh, figures of discrete gender in the first place, but with something that's trying to find a more radical way to do it, but can't actually break that particular mold, if you see what I mean. So I should probably, um, I'm probably over time, I should end on that, if that um, makes sense. Thank you. wondering in, if you could give any kind of indication amongst millennials how common these kinds of identities are. I mean, I know that might be a little difficult. I'm just trying to understand how much of a movement this is for a generation I don't belong to. I am. We've got no doubt. We are, our queer generation's data set is too small to, to really use that to predict in any way at all. Um, but the and, and, and the, there is no statistic that's been circulated. I'm, I'm waiting for someone to try and produce some kind of statistical um, uh, statement that, that might be useful. But um, I mean, the only answer I can give is more common than we think, and this is where 
constantly in talking to my students in Perth, in talking to our uh, participants in, um, who are in, in, in Albany, in, in talking about this, this you know, overseas, uh, the, uh, most, so many people are talking in terms of the, uh, using those, those particular identity labels. And I'm always surprised. And you know, it's, it's funny that I haven't got to that point now of, of not yet being surprised when someone says, oh, but I'm non-binary, allorotty, uh, you know, building this for gender. And you know, it's like putting on that, that straight, that's like, well, fascinating, the uh, face that, that, that one has to do, uh, you know, which is giving a, a generational gap for me. It's just how it feels. But yeah, more common than we think. Now, I, I don't want to say you know, it's like a third or half or so on, but I think it's, it's in circulation. It does seem to be growing. So as that list grows, we're not talking about a niche set of people. Now, what we don't know, though, is, is this always going to apply? Or, you know, is someone who's 19 doing this now uh, going to be doing something different uh, when they're 27? Are uh, the more conservative, more traditional labels going to uh, re-emerge then in that person's life as the easiest, simpler language to do? Is there an economy of time that's actually at play in this that says one's got the time at that particular age to develop language and play with language and so on, but you know, at the, um, the marriage registry office in uh, 2019, it's going to be a completely different thing altogether, you know, or explaining to Marty Phyllis or so on. It, 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 different languages might actually play. So we, we, we've got a lot of work to do. Hello. Um, I'm realizing I might be the token millennial in the room, although only just. Um, okay. And as someone, I've kind of participated in some of these spaces before, and what I always found was that um, there was a sense of play in a lot of these, especially more expansive gender categories, such as fog gender or things like that, that maybe, like I know there are people who do deeply hold those as their own personal genders, but then there's also a whole it's almost like a, yeah, we're, we're kind of making fun of gender at the same time as performing it. Have you found any sense of that in your research? Initially, initially, that's what I believed I was reading. Mm. And uh, in talking then, more and more to people, it's like I'm finding that, no, this is, this is treated with a level of seriousness that lacks that 1990s queer play. So, you know, if, if this were not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving... I'm starting to sound like I'm really nostalgic for the 90s, which I'm not really. But when, when, when we think of sort of the, the, the way in which we would talk of, of you know, fluidity and play that, and experiment and, and so on, uh, we may not have used the word experiment uh, in, that, in that context, but there, there was always something ironic. And I think, and again, I don't want to say that millennials, apologies, lack irony because that is something that is said, and I don't think that's necessarily true at all. But I do think that there is a different way of doing play here, if at all, and that, that is serious. And uh, one of the concerns I think that happens is that it becomes quite easy to offend then in getting that wrong or in making a mistake. And you know, certainly I've had students be, be horrifically offended with, 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 with me by assuming something about their, their sexuality because I didn't know that one of those hundreds of words, which is going to be a lot of work then for us. Uh, Rob, that was really, that was fascinating and great overview. And I feel like, like a, dino, a 90s dinosaur, like dealing with some of this stuff and trying to be more inclusive in doing survey research, which as you can imagine, this as a backdrop is a nightmare. <laughs> and that's an ongoing project. But I was really struck, and I'm picking up on Christie's comment in there about, and you were talking about policing of people uh, policing consistency in one's pre current presentation. What happened to the um, coming out and the narrative, narrating a sexual, you know, narrating a sexual self? Because that was very, very strong in the 90s. So it, it feels weird to me that the um, uh, the reach to authenticity has been preserved. In fact, intensified in some ways in your analysis. But the allowance of saying, well, I was this before and now this is me, is that used by anybody as an escape valve or is this policing, making yeah. people edit everything out of their, their, their that, story? That, that choice is in there. And so it becomes, I think, a competing discourse. I, I, again, I, th I think we've got to try and figure out how those actually work together, though. So in one breath, someone can talk about you know, choice, but also authenticity. So it's no longer coming out and you know, this is my real self. Someone came out to me last week, actually, and it's the first time anyone's done this in years. 
the um, and she, she's she's about my age, so she's you know in, in her forties. And I thought I was really sort of surprised by this. This sort of and it was actually sort of Rob, well, I want to come out, and you know, and it came out as, as effectively bisexual and a bit of explanatory stuff with it. And you know, it's like just take your take your sexuality elsewhere. But the uh, it was mid conference as well, totally inappropriate. The, um, but it was, it was really surprising to actually hear the language of coming out. And this is the one thing that we see, particularly with the younger generation in the study, that the closet is no longer really working as a defining feature. So there's no coming out of the closet now. Um, so it's not just that people are coming out younger, but that it, it, there, there's something new is there. And I don't quite know if we've got a way of pinning down what that is, whether it's working for people as choice or as authenticity, as this is my real self or this is the self that I've chosen. And I think both concepts are at play. And I think that this might be one of the causes there that we see around anxiety in terms of sexuality today as well, that there, there, there is a... a an underlying anxiety, and I, I think this, you know, again becomes a, you know, a serious health problem around how are people actually articulating this? Because it's not necessarily entirely with pride, and you know, this is, this is my real self. It's is that, but also I chose. Is it the right choice? Okay. Well, I don't think that makes sense. Oh. Mine was kind of. A bit confused as well because <laughs> I'm kind of one of the 90s. Um, but is is this something that's emerging for, for like across the board for people, or just for people that have kind of identified as not straight? It is that that was my initial sense. And looking at I've been doing some work on um, uh, sexual webcamming. And there are sites, uh, what is it called, uh, uh, chatterbases. People, people will pay uh, tokens, like tips for a stripper, really, for people who are performing on a webcam. And people will earn you know, a, a moderately acceptable living out of doing this. But one of the things that's really interesting in that, that setting are the number of people who, when you actually ask, uh, will say that their entire sexual experience has been uh, opposite gender. But they will also be open to doing all sorts of really interesting things. So these are the, these young, very tough, masculine-looking, straight men. But what they actually do, the kinds of play they have there, and it's not just for money, though, because this is also about pleasure. Um, the, the, the kinds of play, so, so, so what they, it might be sort of you know, anal play, or it might be the fact that they're performing for other men and enjoying that particular practice, is something's happening around the edges then of identity that's there. Um, where we see this among people, uh, I mean, outside of a, uh, that kind of sexual setting, um, we, we don't have emos anymore like we had uh, only, what, five, six years ago. They, they've all gone. I don't know where, they, they just left. But emo, in, within emo culture, there, there was a lot more of, of, of that as well, of looking for other ways to do straightness. And you know, these were not you know, queer men and women, these were boys and girls. This was you know, uh, looking, looking for something else that was around those edges. And so I think, yes, yeah, it's, it's more widespread. And of course, then, if we have, we have a language of tolerance and a language of acceptance, you know, particularly among uh, those who are school age, you know, we, we're seeing straight people find, well, it's like, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I am this and I am that because I'm okay with the fact that I've got friends who are queer and friends who are heteroflexible and friends who are, and, 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 and so on. So. Mm. So um, there's more of a remark than a question, but I think it's worth looking at Sandra Harding's standpoint theory, mm -hmm. um, and, and in particular the idea that's very popular on Tumblr that you are allowed to speak about this only if you fit within the identity category, um, and the way that drives a kind of policing of the boundaries of those categories. Uh, I came across a hashtag recently that blew my kind of young Gen X, late early millennial mind, which was uh, queer is a slur, that there are people who are seriously arguing that we should all stop using the word queer because some people find it offensive. Mm -hmm. And that only people who perfectly fit within that category really have the right to use it. 
Yeah, look, interesting. This, this, I've, I've heard this as well around it, that 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 uh, the, the the use of the word queer again, and you know, uh, I mean, my instant reaction to that is uh, there's a lot of history then that's being lost, and you know, the, the, the and reclamation is being lost, and a new way of using language is actually at play. I think that's certainly true around the um, that that question of who not just who is authentic, but who is a who has authority to speak. Uh, not just on behalf of, but about at all. And I mean, certainly I, I wouldn't, you know, and you know, a millennial should, you know, throw me out because um, there, there, there is no authority to speak on this if I'm not embodying and, and experiencing those, those particular perspectives. The, um, it was really interesting, this, um, this was at Australian Homo Histories Conference in Adelaide last week, the kinds of debates that were happening uh, privately behind the scenes around the non-binary toilet and the awkwardness around this. So gender neutral toilets had been provided in the normal, usual, usual, usual way. And, the, uh, and, and yet this was this demand for a specific toilet that was only going to be for non-binary people rather than this, 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 and this. And that was, um, you know, the, the, the people having to articulate around that and who can speak and can we get someone who's non-binary to, to, to talk about it. So it's, it's not about having a gender. And it's not about being in the dominant position anymore. It's about you know exactly that, uh, being within that standpoint. And I, I think I think there's something really important to get around that. That, that that's really useful actually. I think that, that shift is is, is important. Okay. Uh, only if you belong to a particular identity. <laughs> uh, otherwise, otherwise you can't. Seeing the fragmentation of gender and sexuality identities, um, whether you're noticing any um, opportunities for like mobilisation and community, um, or whether, I mean, given that um, based on the dominant mm. sexual and gender identity positions, that was really mobilised. So what's happening now? Look, I think that this is um, this is where I think I think something quite fascinating is happening. That there there isn't a uh, coming together. That there isn't a coalitional politics around this. At least not as much as we would have expected, and not in the way that again that we might have done in the past. And all of the debates and arguments and, and structuration that we had to do per se, particularly around uh, lesbian and gay and, 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 and incorporation of bi and, and and so on, that that's not really what's happening. That what's happening now is this kind of understanding that there are a range of identities and that all must be respected. So that it would be improper to um, uh, disapprove of, you know, or to exclude heterosexuality from the table. So if we were going to have a safe space now, and I think this is where where we might talk in terms of um, you know what happens then to spaces, that not just that one needs to have a space for heterosexuals, but that the heterosexuals should be welcome in this space because no matter what they are or how they, they express that, because it's a space for sexualities, and that's because it is just as important and legitimate an identity as others. So what seems to be lost then is that, that question of you know who is oppressed and who's not. The thing we see with this is a categorization of oppression, a hierarchy of oppression. My identity is far more oppressed than yours, and you know how dare you speak on behalf? And I'm not talking about straights and queers now. I'm talking about you know one on that list as opposed to another. And so a lot of the language that occurs then in Tumblr and Facebook and, and other sites and forums is around this identity is more oppressed than this, and it's a really interesting kind of language um, and it does open up then the possibility for the um, for the, 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 the straight man to say I'm more oppressed because I'm excluded in this particular space so there, there's nuance and there's articulation and it's out of time it's out of history and uh, I've got no way, way of really knowing how where that's going to go I think I think we it's wait and see but it's a bit frightening ultimately and the straight straight men have been saying that for a long time as someone who's who's worked a lot in feminist and trying to get women's spaces up, so that's not new. Um, I guess one of the things I was really struck by was the idea that um, all of those very, very precise categories kind of made me think about about a kind of a need to be really precise, really precise about your truth. 
and to be precisely known and to be precisely recognized. And so when you kind of made a throwaway comment about a Facebook quiz to work out which of that long list of things, or probably BuzzFeed, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the idea that, that we're so desperate to know the truth about ourselves and to pin it down really precisely. There's something vaguely kind of scientific about it, that we can kind of, that it's, that it's not fluid, it's static, that we can really pin it down by answering somebody else's questions yeah. and know it, but also that that has to be recognized by other people. And that it's public, so it's not about all of those preferences were always things people had, but they kept to themselves and they told the people who needed to know about them. But now a complete stranger needs to recognize those things about me. And I'm, I'm curious about what's, what, what that is, what that, that need to have that kind of stuff recognized. Again, I think you know, a lot of this, this is that, that Oprahization. You know, so I mean, that's a generation ago, but that this is where this has actually gone. And this is the, 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 the final output of Oprah's career that that what 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 that that, that kind of uh, uh, self focus has actually produced what I'm thinking about is you know uh, I mean I don't know about others I remember being 15 and I remember those those kinds of anxieties that one had. they weren't really anxieties they were you know it's like, you know, this and like that how am I going to express it what 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 are the appropriate ways I said that I'm this to that person and that person I've sort of indicated this, now they're talking to each other, and, 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 and those were quite serious issues, but I, I wonder now, when you've got such an array, what does this do for a young person who's 14 or 15 or 13 or maybe or any, anyone really, um, you know, what kinds of pressures are really at play then uh, in this? So it's sort of like, I, where, where it's become that, that level of precision, but how are we going to articulate it? And, you know, and not just that, but how are we going to articulate difference? So I want to be... Um, one of those, I, I want to be, you know, a romantic sapiosexual as well, like my friend. But you know, but we're we're, we're different, and you know, like, and, and now people are going to look at that difference, and then people are going to be pointing that out. So, so how how to, how to how to make that difference uh, understandable as well? Can we both be sapiosexual, or you know, because maybe we can't be. So we might have to find a new word. Maybe I'm demi sapiosexual, and because you know, I'm only halfway there. Uh, and bring the history in, and bring one's own, you know, expectations, and one's future desires, and, you know, what what magazine one looked at, and how one might have looked at a picture of someone, and you know, and and, and expressed their their attraction, and and so on. So it's it's it, 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 it's it's work, I think. It's just pinpoint. Work. But also the reality of statistics, as someone who is a qualitative researcher who does quite a lot of stat stuff, is that we will obliterate all of those nuances because stats doesn't cope with those kinds of things. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, we, that's something I'm coming under a lot of pressure from, from people who are increasingly wanting their, all of those various different ways of being and identifying recognized in the questions that we ask in surveys. And we can't put all of those things in surveys. And so what we do when people do insist on changing them is we obliterate them all and we say, oh, you mean you're bisexual. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real problem for, for research to kind of think about what we're going to do with this as a problem, as a research problem, and, and it, is it enough just to hope it goes away? Mm -hmm. And Kath, of course, Kath, Kath Aubrey, of course, did, did, did buy plus as a way of trying to, to, to manage that, which I think we've gone beyond now with, with this as well, that, uh, that, that that is not acceptable to people. I had a PhD student early this year who was uh, going through her enrolment and wanted a non-binary uh, status on this and the other status did not work on her enrollment form and so she wasn't going to um, to enroll and the really interesting thing though is that in the end um, in the end they, they enrolled as she and as I think it's male fe yeah, female and used the word miss and uh, like miss and I, I thought this was a, a very very sort of conservative way then of doing this but this was about trying to find something that was really going to work around this as it was meaningful and that you know I'm, I was guilty of trying to obliterate this by saying but just just enroll as anything and have that argument in your PhD as opposed to you know have that argument and, and create more paperwork for me to deal with so, you know, so, so there's a paperwork phenomenal please join me in